The other day, someone asked me whether I've ever seen a man win custody of his children in court. Yes, I have. It doesn't happen often. However, it happens more often than most men think it happens. If you're a man and you're interested in winning custody of your child in court, then keep listening. Now, just as a preliminary matter, before I really dive into this, I want to make a bit of a clarification. When people say, Damon, have you ever heard uh, or seen a man win custody of his child in court? What they're really asking in most instances is whether I have ever seen a court determine that the man should be the person who gets to decide where the child lives. So I, I want to be clear about that because so often people ask about custody and and they think that men don't win custody, but custody involves a number of things, uh, in particular, the right to make certain educational decisions about the child or the right to manage the affairs of the child. And so uh, that kind of thing happens all the time and those rights are typically shared. But in this particular video, when we're talking about custody, we're talking about the specific, the specific issue of whether a court uh, where, or whether I have seen a court order that a man can be the person who determines where the child resides. So this is my theory on how judges decide custody cases, and I'll tie it into to how it relates to, to men. Judges generally are trying to make the best decision possible, or as what uh, one judge said to me once was, hey, I just want to get it right. Part of getting it right involves applying the law of the state to the facts that are involved in a particular case. Oftentimes, judges use their own personal experiences uh, to apply those, those laws to those facts. And in many instances, judges will bring their own, uh, for lack of a better way to say it, biases and prejudices to the bench when they're making those cases or when they're making those decisions. One of those biases, one of those prejudices, one of those uh, mindsets that, that judges bring to the bench with them is this idea that children belong with the mother, particularly in the early years of the child's development. Although judges have that bias, most judges don't like to think of themselves as bias. So those judges look for opportunities to prove to themselves that they don't have that bias or they don't have that prejudice. They look for opportunities to award custody to the father. It enables them to say, hey, look, I don't have any bias. Just the other day, I awarded custody to the father. Now, a judge is not going to make a ruling against his or her own bias or, or, or prejudice for just any case. It has to be a special kind of case. Now, I think it has to be the kind of case that when you hear the facts, a reasonable person would say, what kind of mother is that? No, it is not enough for a father to just be a great father, unless he's a great father and his uh, teenage children have told the judge they want to live with that father. Then it's enough to be a great father. But great fathers with nothing else? they typically get standard possession and the opportunity to pay child support. So the practical reality is, if you want to be the father or the parent, if you're the father and you want to be the person who determines where the child resides, you're going to have to do two things. You're going to have to prove that you're a great father and you're going to have to prove that she's a bad mother. Now, again, this is just my theory. This isn't necessarily what the law says. So, how do you show the judge that you're a great father and she's not a great mother? Well, to start, you have to do the kinds of things that great fathers do. Let's start with a checklist. You need to be able to articulate the role that you play in the child's life. You need to be able to articulate the role that you play in providing the child's hygiene, uh, meals, food, sleep schedule, education, emotional nurturing, healthcare, entertainment, playtime activity, and miscellaneous needs. 
you also need to be able to discuss the future that you envision for the child and the role that you plan to play to bring that vision to reality. You'll see why in a moment. In most states, judges are directed to determine child custody by looking at a set of factors. For example, in Texas, judges are uh, advised, ordered, directed uh, to look at a set of factors uh, to determine what's in the best interest of the child. Judges are supposed to consider several factors in determining what's in the best interest of the child. They're supposed to look at the desires of the child. They're supposed to look at the physical and emotional needs of the child now and in the future. They're supposed to look at the parental they're supposed to look at the parental abilities of those who are trying to uh, obtain custody of the child. They're supposed to look at the plans that the parties have for the children. They're supposed to look at the stability of the home. They're supposed to look at the acts or omissions of the parents that may lead someone to believe that the current parent-child relationship is not a good one. And then the judge can look at any other factor that's important to the judge. Now, if you're listening to this video and you're in a state other than Texas, then you may be able to help yourself figure out the factors by doing a Google search or some other kind of search query using statements such as child custody factors in and then insert whatever state you're in. By creating a checklist and writing down the factors or the roles that you've played in line with that checklist, you put yourself in a much better position to impress a judge in court. While you're busy gathering proof about the greatness of you as a father, unfortunately, you're going to have to remember to gather some information about the faults of the other party as a mother. As I suggested earlier, you're going to have to present facts about the mother that might lead the judge to believe that the mother is not a great mother. Winning does not require a complete assassination of her character. However, you may have to show her parenting abilities in a negative light if her parenting abilities are negative. Now, I'm going to take a moment here and, 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 and tell you that many people would disagree with this kind of line of thought. There, I have clients who take the position that they want to show that they are great fathers and that the mother is a great mother. And, uh, and there's a lot of logic to that. After all, after this hearing is over, you're going to have to continue to co-parent. And if you've spent uh, time in a court hearing bashing that person, sometimes it can be difficult for the mother to uh, let that go and she'll hold a grudge against you for a long time. So it's important to say that. Uh, however, uh, it's also the case that winning, given the, the mindset that many judges have, is going to require that you cast the mother in a negative light. Ultimately, you're going to have to really be honest with yourself and talk to your lawyer about what the the true likelihood of success is in the case. And if you think you have a legitimate opportunity at winning, then it does make sense, uh, some would say, to pursue that more aggressive angle. But if you don't think you have a chance at winning, then the aftermath uh, or the trade-off of being aggressive and nasty uh, in, in court may not be worth the effort. Now, while gathering your evidence, one of the things that you want to keep in mind is that some things are only issues to the extent that they relate to the uh, other person's ability to be a good parent for the child. Or to say it a different way, the, the person's negatives only matter to the extent that they impact the best interest of the child. To use a somewhat extreme example, Evidence that the mother of the child is a stripper from 12 p.m. till 2 p.m. doesn't have as much impact on the case as evidence that the mother is a stripper from 4 p.m. till midnight would have on the case. See, in one of those instances, you could make the argument that uh, her actions during that time period have, uh, have an impact on her ability to parent, whereas actions that she engages in while the child is at school are not likely to have the same impact 
on uh, the, the parent's ability to parent. Here are some questions that you might want to ask yourself about the mother of your child. Would your child rather live with you than live with his or her mother? Does your work schedule provide more opportunity for you to spend time with the children? Has she failed to give your children any medications? Has she ever struck the child or the children so hard that she's left marks? Does she mentally or physically abuse your child? Are your children scared of the mother's current boyfriend or girlfriend? Has she ever failed to supervise your child? Does she leave your child with inappropriate sitters? Is she late delivering your child to school activities? Does she miss important events in your child's life? Does she fail to use car seats? Does she have a valid driver's license? Does she have any pending cases that involve alcohol or drugs? Has she ever used drugs in the presence of the child? Has she ever disobeyed a court order? The more of these questions that you can answer yes, the better position you'll be in at trial. Once you present overwhelming evidence that you have provided for the child's physical and emotional needs and will continue to do so in the future, and you provide evidence that the mother is not a good mother for any multiple number of reasons, you'll be able to place yourself in a situation where you can benefit from the judge's desire to prove something to himself or herself. Good luck. And feel free to leave a comment if there's anything that you'd like to discuss. Take care.